we are going to sort of talk about two topics today. Um, our main topic is what you see here, but there's also going to be a little bit of, um, how do I say, like, like a, a, a little bit of a sneak peek as to something we're going to be doing um, probably right after we get back from Thanksgiving. Maybe sooner than that. We'll see. Um, hopefully sooner than that. So um, today we're going to talk about the uh, the mean value theorem, uh, and that's going to be used to determine uh, when average rates of change are equal to instantaneous rates of change. Um, the way that we'll do this is by calculating the slope of the secant line. We've done this a thousand times before, but we're going to calculate the slope of the secant line, and then we're going to find out where on the curve has that slope like on the in the derivative right so let's go through and let's just show what's going on here so there's two theorems that come up uh the first one the main one is called the mean value theorem and the mean value theorem basically says all right if you've got a if you've got a curve and it's continuous and differentiable between two points then you know that the slope between the two endpoints of your your range, somewhere on that region, there's a place that has to have that slope. All right. Um, that is to say, if you were to if you calculate the secant line with the endpoints and set it equal to the derivative, you'll be able to find a place where that derivative is equal to it, and you'll be able to find the x value, and you'll know that it's in between a and b. Now, Rawls' theorem, which is another theorem that somebody's going to name check sometime, um, is basically the exact same thing. The only difference is between mean value theorem and Rawls' theorem is that um, f of a equals f of b. And I have this written wrong, so let me fix that. The y values are the same. So that is to say, um, like if we were to if we were to go through and you'd have two different points that have a y value of five. If those, you know, if your a and your b, you plug them into your function, you pop out five for both of them then you can use Rawls theorem. But it's the same thing. The mean value theorem and Rawls theorem, the same thing. The only difference, Rawls theorem is just like a special case. So if you always want to use mean value theorem for doing stuff like this, doesn't matter. You're good. Rawls theorem is just a more specific situation and lots of things in Rawls theorem are zero. So oftentimes you... Um, have an easier problem to solve, right? Because zero is always easier than a lot of other things. So, you know, eh, the six to one half a dozen of the other, but me personally, I remember mean value theorem. All right, so let's go over a couple of these. So we're going to find the value or values of C. So there might, you know, there could be multiple places, right? So, so basically, we're going to solve for x where this is true. So here's our function, and we're going to we're going to use this function and solve for x. Basically, what we're doing is we're taking the average rate of change, the the average rate of change between one and negative one, and setting it equal to the derivative, and finding out where that's true. So okay, let's do let's do this. The average rate of change. Well, let's let's start with here's our b, here's our a. Let's start with b. Let's plug in one. We got five minus five is zero. Let's plug in negative one. We get negative five minus five is negative ten, right? 
and then B is 1, and A is negative 1. So we end up with 10 over 2, which equals 5. So, so our average rate of change is 5. So basically, we're, we're at being asked, what value of x does the derivative have where the slope is 5? So let's take the derivative and set that equal to 5. Right? Well, what's the derivative? 3 comes down, we got 15x squared. 2 comes down, minus 10x. And we want that to be the same as this. We want that to be 5, so that we can figure out what value of x makes that work. And so, um, you know, you can bring this over 15x squared minus 10 x minus 5 equals 0. I like to make my life easier. There's a common factor of 5. Divide that away. 3x squared minus 2x minus 1 equals 0. And I want to say... That should do it, right? Factoring. Uh, you could also use the quadratic formula, you know, no, no big either way. Um, so let's double check. 3x times x is 3x squared. 1x minus 3x, negative 2x. 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. OK, that works out just fine. Set them equal to 0. This one gives us negative 1 third. This one gives us one. And so um, what are the places that satisfy this equation? Well, the first one, first one, C equals one. The second one, C equals negative one third. Now, if I remember correctly, I may not, but if I do remember correctly, I think this one is going to ask you to give decimal answers. So uh, rounded to three decimal places. So like negative 0.333 and then one, right? But they're on this interval, both of these. One is on the end point, which is fine. Negative one third is in between negative one and one. So we know that that's fine. And so both of these answers are good. Those are the two places, those are the two x values, one and negative one third, where the slope is five. Ta-da. Let's do another one. Same exact problem, just a different function, right? Well, we've got from six to eight. So already we know that b is eight and a is six. Now let's plug these in and get our y values. Uh, natural log of 6 minus 5. Natural log of 1 is 0, right? 8. Natural log of three minus, uh, 8 minus 5 is 3. So we got the natural log of 3. So we end up with the natural log... of 3 over 2 that is our that is our average rate of change for the endpoints so now we want to figure out where on this graph is the slope natural log of 3 over 2 so we take the derivative we want to know where is that natural log of 3 over 2 so we can cross multiply and then solve for x right And we can distribute this natural log of 3. Or not, we can actually divide the natural log of 3. It really just depends on how you like to solve. And then we add 5. It's that, because I didn't divide. I... That looks better. Uh, 
And so we ask ourselves, is this on the thing we want it to be on? Let's double check. Let's just make sure that what we have is what we're wanting, right? So let's pull out our good old friend, the calculator, so we can know for sure. Two divided by the natural log of three minus five. Oh, plus five. There's a, that's a plus sign, isn't it? Because this is a minus five over here. This is a plus five. Hey, good. We can all catch our mistakes. It's important. That's why we double check our work. So this is roughly 6.8204. And so, okay, so this, is this in this range? Yes. So we know what we have is what we're looking for, right? So we did we find the value or values of C that satisfy this equation? Yes, we did. It's right here. Now, you know, if they ask you to round, put this. If they don't ask you to round, put this. On the AP exam, you can leave this here. Remember, you don't have to simplify your answer on the AP exam. So if you come out with this, put that. Don't don't put this decimal here. Put the put the fraction that you don't have to worry about trying to deal with again you know they're being paid to to look at your answers so make them earn it okay so that's the that's the mean value theorem um and now what we're gonna do is we're gonna sort of transition here into a slightly different concept um we want to we've got the fact that the derivative is 2x if the derivative is 2x, what would the original function have been? So f prime is 2x. If we think about it, where does 2x come from when we've taken the derivative? Well, if we end up with a, a, a linear term, we started with a quadratic term, right? And if I take the derivative, well, that is, in fact, 2x. But the problem is there's always the potential that there was like a like a number here. It could have been x squared plus 2. Remember that the, the numbers just go away when we take the derivative. So whenever we are being asked, hey, um, if the derivative was, was this, what was the original function? We always have to account for the fact that there could have been a constant term hanging on there. And... You know, it to me, it, I don't care what letter you use, but the 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 classical letter that is always used that I've seen is the letter C for constant. So so if the original if the uh, derivative function was two x, the original function was x squared plus some constant. And so, like, they're going to ask you at some point, hey, what, what's, uh, what's the the possibilities? And then you'll you'll give them x squared plus c. And this is sort of all the possibilities because c could be zero, one, two, five, negative six, pi over two, whatever. It doesn't matter, but it could have been whatever. But now, so what we can do is we can actually calibrate this function for these initial conditions like they're telling you hey the they're telling you here hey look the point zero zero satisfies this equation if i plug in zero for x and zero for y it should be true i can solve for c this way right so for part a i'm just going to do that well here's my here's my sort of generic function let's find the specific function f of x equals zero when x equals zero. So we can find c, right? 
Well, zero equals zero plus C, so C has to be equal to zero. So this is so our so our calibrated function is just x squared. So now I can figure out f of one, right? I just plug in one. So what is f of one? It's one. Now for part B, they're gonna have us do it again, but now it's gonna be different, right? So let's do it. Let's say f of five is 21. Well, what does that mean? That means if x is five, so five squared plus c, right? Well, what's five squared is 25. Subtract, you should end up with c equals negative four. Well, now look, that means our new special bespoke function, x squared plus c, well, c is negative four, so x squared minus four. So now if I want f of one, I just plug in one. One squared minus four, that's negative three, right? Let's do c now. Once again, we're going to calibrate our our constant here by knowing that f of negative two pops out five. That is to say, negative two squared plus c had better be five. Well, what's negative two squared? That's four. So we got five equals four plus c, so c had better be one, right? So our function here, x squared plus c plus 1. So now I can figure out, well, what's f of 1 here? Plug in 1 for x. 1 squared is 1 plus 1 is 2. So the answer for this one is 2. All right? Same idea going forward with the rest of these. I want to know what all the possible functions are with the given derivative. That means I want to know what is f of x and that equals something plus c. Well, what would have given me x to the seventh power? Something x to the eighth, right? Well, if I bring that x to the eighth down, that gives me eight times x to the seventh, but I don't want to have that eight out front. What, is, what needs to be out here to cancel out that 8? A 1 eighth, right? So, and you can always double check to make sure that what this is, if you take the derivative, you get that, right? I take the derivative. Bring down the 8. 8 and 1 eighth is 1. So this is just x to the 7th. And then the the uh, constant goes away, plus zero, so same as this. So I know that I did it right. And this is the way that they're going to want you to enter it into your uh, your answer blank, one-eighth x to the eighth plus c. Capital C, I think. Um, it might accept lowercase c, I don't know, but capital C for sure is is the one I always use. All right, let's do another one. Same idea as before. Now look, we want to know all the possible functions with this derivative. Well, something plus c, right? I want to get 2x in the end. Well, x comes from x squared, right? When I take the derivative, I get 2x. So that's that's good. That's 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 all I need. I don't need to do any fudge factor or anything like that, right? So x squared plus c. And again, if you are not sure, double check by taking the derivative x squared. The derivative is 2x. c, the derivative is just nothing because it's a constant. So we know that we're good to go. So let's do this one now. So now what we want is to have our derivative be 2x minus 3. Well, this part. Again, the thing that I've been saying all along is don't try and do it all at once. Do one piece at a time. We already 
did this part, right? We already know how to find 2x from the derivative, and that's it's x squared, right? So here we know, but we want to have this minus 3 here too. And if we remember, numbers come from linear terms, right? And it's just once you take the derivative, you drop off the x. So this negative 3 comes from negative 3 x, right? And so when we do this, if we look, take the derivative. The derivative of x squared is 2x. Check. The derivative of negative 3x is negative 3. Check. The derivative of plus c is nothing. And so it goes away, which is what we want. All right? Part 3. Let's do it with this one. Once again, I already did that part. I already did that part. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel for those. We just need to figure out what this one is. Right? So I need to figure out what gives me 3x squared. 3x squared, well, what's the next level is just x cubed, right? Well, when I take the derivative of x cubed, bring down the 3, drop the exponent by 1, and I get 3x squared. Hey, that's exactly what I needed, right? So there we go. And again, double check. Did I do it right? What's the derivative of x cubed? 3x squared. Check. What's the derivative of x squared? 2x. Check. What's the derivative of negative 3x? Negative 3. Check. What's the derivative of plus c? 0, which is not here. Check. Don't overthink this. Don't try and think too hard about these. I promise. All right. Here. Again, take the time to figure out what's what. The derivative of what thing is cosine? Well, isn't that sine? Right? Now, this is going to be the same. It's always the same thing on the inside. But now we just have to figure out what's going to go in front to make sure that any of the chain rule stuff cancels out, right? Because I just want cosine of 9t. If I take the derivative here, this is 9 times the cosine of 9t. I don't want that. I want I don't want this 9. So I better have something out front here to cancel out this 9, right? So let's do 1 9th. That way that the 9 cancels out. Let's do the same thing here. Again, I know where sine comes from. If I take if I take the derivative of something and I get sine, that had better have, have been negative cosine, right? And again, the thing on the inside stays the same. When I do the derivative here, I get one third sine of t over three. I don't want this one third here, so I better have something to cancel that out. Well, what about a three, right? Three times one third cancels out. There should be a minus sign here, right? Because I want a minus sign. And again, what's missing? Plus C. So if I look here and I take the derivative, the 9 comes out, sine turns to a cosine, I'm good. I do this, I take the derivative of cosine, the negative cancels out, becomes a positive. The 1 third comes out, cancels out with the 3, I get positive sine of t over 3. Check. Plus c, check. All good. That's what we're talking about here. That's our final answer. All right, last one. Here's 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 the doozy. They're they're giving you the double derivative and they want you to figure out the original one. Now, basically what you're going to do here is you're going to do the problems that we've been doing just twice, right? So let's do let's do step 1. Where our eventual goal is to find the position that is to say s 
right? But in the meantime, we're probably going to want to find velocity because we're given acceleration. Velocity, when you take the derivative, that's acceleration. So we got to find velocity first, right? So let's do that. The double derivative. is 9 times e to the 3t. Now, here's the thing. Remember, when you, what gives you the derivative of e? Just e, right? So we know that going up the level, we want e to the 3t. Well, when I take the derivative again, I get that. But I don't want 3 in front. I want 9 in front, right? So what needs to be out here? There needs to be a 3 already out here, right? That way, when I do this and bring that down, that becomes 9. Yeah? So the, the, fir the second derivative is this. The first derivative is going to be this. What am I missing? Plus C. Well, what's C? I should probably figure out what C is, right? Well, when the velocity, when time is zero, the velocity is 20 units. So let's figure that out. Well, okay, so the velocity, this is velocity, right? Because this is acceleration. The velocity is 20 when t is 0. Well, what's e to the 0? Because this is 3 times 0 is just 0, right? e to the 0 is 1. So we get really is 20 equals 3 times 1 plus c. So isn't c just 17? So our our, our velocity function for this problem Is that? Well, so now we just have to do that again to find our position function. So we have this. Again, remember, this is v. And the derivative that gets you the velocity comes from position, right? So let's find position. Well, let's do the same thing we did up here. 3 times e to the 3t. Well, again, E doesn't change, but then when we take the derivative, we get 3 times e to the 3t. Well, and that's what we want, right? So we know our position function, this part, when we integrate this little part, ooh, I said a word, integrate. Uh, we'll talk about that in a couple weeks. Spoilers. We get e to the 3t, right, for our position function. 17, well, that's a number. So we end up with an x term, right? Well, when we take the derivative of that x term, we get a number, right? One. Well, so what needs to be out here in order for this to be the number we want? Just like that, right? So 17x is what this becomes. I was trying to go the entire time without saying that word. And then plus C. Well, what's C? Because I got to get my actual IRL function. I know that the initial position, when time is 0, the position is 6. Well, let's, let's plug all that in. And this should be a T, not an X. Sorry. We're using T as our variable. Sometimes we all get confused. Most often it's just me. T. Anyway, so. It's just a big slanty T, right? Yeah. <laughs> all right, so T is zero. So when T is zero, position is at six. So what we got E times three to the zero plus 17 times zero plus C. 
Well, e to the three times zero, that's one. So we got six equals one plus 17 times zero is zero plus c. Subtract, you end up with c equals five, right? So we want to find the position function, right? Well, we just found our c for our position function. So F of, they may say s of t, but f of t is fine too. e to the 3t plus 17t plus 5. This right here is our position function, s. So note, all we did here, all we did here is we used the same skill from the previous problems. We just did it twice this time working backwards to figure out our answer. 